Hello everyone, this is BOF Live. I'm Tim Blanks and today we're talking to Jonathan Anderson, whose perspective on what human beings are capable of um, has always uh, been one of my favorite, um, my favorite things to explore in fashion. Um, and I mean by that, that he is a, is a disciple of craft and artisanship. And I think that um, in these times, I feel more and more people are responding to that idea. But first of all, I want to find out where Jonathan is and where he has been uh, where he has been in lockdown and how he has been managing it. Hi Tim, how are you? Um, I, um, I'm in London, I'm in my house in London, um, you know, being myself at home as anyone, everyone else is, it's sort of, um, it's a trip, let's put it that way, um, but I think as weeks go on, I think it's becoming more of a worthwhile trip to be on. <laughs> Um, but no, I'm, I'm in London working away. <laughs> now, why do you, why do you, why do you say worthwhile? Um, you mentioned emotional roller coasters, and I think that's what a lot of people are feeling, but, uh, I know I am, I feel like crying all the time, which is a new sensation for me, but you reach the end of the ride. Um, what do you see at the end of the ride? I don't know. I, I think, you know, I don't know how, how long is it? It's two months. If we're, we're nearly two months, are we into it? Um, I think in the beginning, uh, you know, in terms, you know, we were talking about emotional roller coasters. It's sort of, I think in the beginning, you go through complete like horror, like um, you feel completely powerless. You, you kind of feel completely superficial. You feel, what what can I do? Um, so I think you go, first of all, I think you go into kind of like family, home, what do I do, panic. Um, and then I, I think after watching the news, um, I think at six o'clock religiously, <laughs> um, you start to kind of go into the kind of realization of um, where you're at. And I think I, I, I think I think the first month I found it probably easier than the second month because I think you are trying to process it, and now you're in the moment of solutions. So you've got to try to find solutions and. Um, and I think only probably the last two weeks have I started to feel like it is now action and solution time, you know what I mean? Or, uh, what, you know, kind of understanding why we are here, I think, is um, where I'm at. I feel like it's sort of like a kind of, uh, some sort of odd crusade that you do on your own <laughs> sort of at home. So I don't know, it's a, it's, it's an, it's a very, um, it's very cathartic. It's uh, it, it can be disturbing at times. You were talking about dreams. I think uh, you can have uh, crazy dreams. Um, are you having? Are you dreaming? Are you aware of dreaming more than usual? Yeah, I, I'm wondering. Is it because it's quieter? Mm. You know, I, I you know sometimes I, at my house I can hear cars go by, and you don't really hear that. And it's sort of, in the morning, it's really quiet. It feels like you're in the countryside, but you're in London. Um, so I think maybe is it the, the brain has slowed down. So it's like at night, it was reactivating. Yeah. Um, reliving out fantasies or um, horror shows. <laughs> I mean, there's a theory that because people aren't as busy during the day, they're compensating in their dream world, which, I mean, Aborigines would have something interesting to say about that because they believe that you're living in your dreams and this is the dream. Yeah. Um, uh, my dreams have just got horrible. I, I mean, they, they were beautiful and, and spectacular and fantastic and now they're just awful and it's really disturbing. Yeah, no, I, I, because I think it's sort of, I think it's sort of, um, it, it's sort of like being told that you're grounded in a weird way, the globe has been kind of said, you know, everyone's grounded, you know, you've done something wrong. It, 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 sometimes I feel like, in a way, I, I've had dreams like that, where you're kind of like, you can't get out. <laughs> like, you're kind of trapped. And I, and I think it's sort of like, you know, as if your parents had turned around and grounded you, because you need to learn something. Mm. Um, and, and in a weird way, I think that's how I'm sort of, 
getting through it that I feel like there has to be something to be learned. Um, but I don't want to read the tea leaves. I just want to kind of experience the kind of uh, the emotional part of it. Because well, Jeff, like Jeff says it's like nature sent us to our room yeah. you know, to, to learn a lesson. How, how, are you, how have you been able to work through the last few months? What have you been doing? Um, I've been doing this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've been doing, I, I've kept my schedule as it was in the calendar, um, but it's all done digitally. And, and then I speak to both Jenny and Pascal in every evening, every morning, um, trying to work out solutions. I think in the beginning, it felt like I was um, doing HR. <laughs> in the beginning um, and just trying to logistically um, work out how I was going to be able to keep shows or collections or all the development that we were doing how not to drop it and you know keep every everyone in the team going um, I think you know I think I started to realize what my job my role is you know more so in this period because it is about kind of cohesively bringing a team together. I think I, I've realized this more in this moment than I've ever done, even before a show. I, it, you know, for me, it's sort of like, uh, I have, I feel like I have a huge responsibility. Like, you know, I, I can't, um, I'm not a doctor, so I can't help that way, but I, I feel like my, my job is to make sure that everyone keeps their job. So every morning I'm kind of, you know, that is my biggest worry. You know, I, I sit there going, okay, well, what can we do to keep this going? That people, it, not even just about money, but even keeping people stimulated, you know, that they have a purpose um, in what we're doing, you know? So I, I think that is something that sort of um, has kept my day going, you know? You know every, it's the same job, but it's just, I don't have any touch. I don't have any feel. It's, it's all very, very like 2D. Um, and as I was saying earlier, then I, I struggle with things like uh, social media platforms at the moment, because I feel like I've talked into a computer all day. And when I go then look at my phone, I feel uh, slightly, kind of uh, jaded somehow or perplexed I, my eyes can't focus on it anymore because i feel like i've been talking to people digitally all day yeah because um i, I said at the beginning uh, uh talking about you and the human hand you, you your reverence for artisans has been so it's shaped loeve what has shaped your label and then it sh shaped loeve after that um are you finding consolation in I mean, your work is so three-dimensional. You're just talking about doing everything 2D. But are you yourself finding consolation in your objects? I know how you love to rearrange things and tell new stories with the stuff that you have in your own house. But are you finding that a sort of inspiration or consolation or anything at this particular? Uh, I've, I've had two feelings with it. I've had kind of like... Uh, probably like a lot of people, I think like, why do I have all this stuff? <laughs> like, I think, you know, uh, I have, uh, uh, you know, I collect ceramics and I collect art and different things. And I'm just like, well, why do I have all this stuff? I think I went through that in the first two weeks. It was, a, it's more time than I've ever spent in this house since I ever lived in it. Um, I'm usually back and forth from Paris. So it's sort of, it's the first time I've had like solid time, like <laughs> in the house for two months of it. Um, so I kind of went through a complete rejection of like, I want to live in a white box and I, you know, it's sort of like, I can't deal with possessions. And then slowly, um, in the second week, I started to kind of think, well, why have I put all these things together? Or why am I drawn to a bowl? Or why am I, uh, you know, drawn to a piece of textile or a painting or, um, and I think it, it is through this kind of uh, obsession about people that make things or like can actually make it from start to finish. Um, so then through this you know, process, we, you know, at the Weber, we started in Casa, which was like a kind of, I didn't feel comfortable in the first month being <laughs> like seen or talking. 
because I didn't really know what I saw or what I wanted uh, in general. Um, and then I thought to myself, well, maybe I could get other people to kind of talk instead of me. Um, so I then asked all people that we've worked with to kind of start communicating about what they do. And I just felt like, you know, I, I'm, I want to use our platform to show people who work sometimes on their own um, all the time, um, which is kind of like in isolation, making things with their hands. Um, because I felt like I needed to go back to the very beginning, which was these are the people that inspire me. So at the moment where my inspiration has like kind of collapsed because I feel like I don't know where the landmark is. I did fashion shows and they feel like they were 10 years ago. Um, uh, because I literally finished shows and I was then, it was like bang into lockdown. Um, and those shows, I, I, I work very hard, but it's like they didn't, they don't matter or something. It was like a weird kind of thing. Um, so for me, it was like this idea of making with the hands is kind of like going back to when I first started Brown, which was this idea of actually making things yourself. Um, I, I think there's something in history. We have, we, we have this thing where we want to, to make things and to display or to exchange. Um, it's, it's a kind of natural thing. We want to make something and either give it or sell it. It's sort of like a kind of transaction. We have done it for thousands of years. Um, and I think for me, it was, it's this process that, you know, going back to that thing of like, um, how do you, your responsibility and things like being kind of, uh, detached in a weird way from being in fashion is a very kind of abstract thing. You, you don't, how can I contribute at the moment in the way in which a doctor can or a nurse or someone who delivers the groceries. Um, and then I started to kind of, I think when America kind of started and so many people were losing so many jobs, I was like, kind of like, this is my responsibility. I need to make sure that every single person who makes something, no matter if it's from the Lubavitch Craft Prize, to the, the artisans who work in the factory, to the designers and the design team, to the, you know, I need to make sure that these people don't disappear because they are my hands. They're, they're, they're the knowledge that um, makes the product that I do. Um, so for me, I when I kind of like the kind of depression of being, um, why am I okay? Well, what is the solution now um, to make this work? You know, when you look at the things you've collected and uh, the the artisans that that you're passionate about, do you find yourself? Um, becoming more sensitive to their headspace when they were making those things. A lot of those people were making things under extremely uh, trying circumstances. There might be a war or, you know, they were, they were, they were creating um, as a reaction to huge social changes in, in their times. Are you feeling, do you feel a different, a, a different uh, attitude to what you do now, you know, you're saying that you've been thinking through these, um, you know, having these, this challenge to your, your idea of how you can actually contribute, but you feel that you're rethinking what the actual creative act for you in fashion is, that it's, it is something more intimate and, um, I, I, I use the word consolation, but actually that is, that is what I think that, that, you know, your last two shows, uh, the, the shows that already seen so far away was so um, strong in, in that the artisanal, the artisanal sense. And so, um, so transporting, you know, and just plain beautiful. Mm. And, you know, obviously beauty isn't 
beauty is a consolation, but it is not, beauty does not feed you or uh, support you in, in extremely trying circumstances, or does it? Is there a way that, that actually what you're doing is performing a service? I, I think there's definitely something to be said that in fashion there is escapism. Um, I think fashion can be a confidence builder for people. I know for myself, I think it, you know, through doing my job, I get confidence in myself, which I mean. Uh, I think it definitely has this ability to uh, take you to um, a different reality. Sometimes escapism is good. Um, I think some probably the best literature is about escapism. You know, I think sometimes the best art is about escapism. Which I mean, I was, you know, and I, I think there is something in the idea of the creative or the make that makes you kind of um, feel connected to someone or to to something. You know, it's sort of like, you know, it's like. I really love the ceramicist Lucy Ree. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You know, when you were talking about like, you know, how people coped in very trying situations. Here you have like um, someone who, is, who had to immigrate um, to London, who then it starts at one point because of like the war had to make buttons. Um, and in that, there, when I kind of rediscover through her work and I find out that she had to make buttons in that period, those become even more important because they hold uh, tragedy, they hold romance, um, they have aesthetic, they have hand, they have something made uh, that encapsulates a moment. And, and I think, you know, it transcends you, that object transcends you. And I think, you know, when, you know, before we got on the call, we were talking about disobedient bodies that I did at the Wakefield. For me, it's this idea that fashion is part of the creative landscape. As much as architecture and art and uh, textile design or ceramics or dance, it doesn't matter. For me, it's all like an, a kind of visceral output that kind of makes you feel connected in your moment. And I actually weirdly think that leading up to this, I think we probably should have seen it because we weren't connected in the moment. I, I know that I can admit that I feel like I was floating on borrowed time somehow, like th that nothing was processing. Um, you know, you would sit in meetings, it was about social media. It's like, you know, how many followers, how many likes, how many interactions, uh, uh, imagery, we need, more, we need more content. What is the content? What is the, you know, so you, you ended up kind of, everyone was lost in like a sea of content. Um, but none of, it, none of it meant anything. Um, none of it was rememberable. Um, it was part of a kind of, we were kind of, cruising through um but that's what's quite nice when you fall off a cliff because the you can only go up again you know it's sort of i think that's what's so fantastic in tragedy is that it can only be better you know well it can it can be an education or it can be a catastrophe. I, talking about disobedient bodies, a, a show which I wish the world could have seen because, you know, exhibitions about fashion have become such a huge thing over the last few years. And this show, this show the, the way this show fused art and fashion was, was such an education. And I think that, um, I know at the time we were talking about Issey Miyake, who's a designer that you have always admired. And there's a, there was always such a humanism in what he did. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, when you talk about, you know, Lucy Ree making buttons, this incredible ceramicist making buttons as part of the war effort. And so this tiny utilitarian object is infused with her artistry and her artisanship. I feel that that could be 
a new role for fashion in a way, a new, a new, a new, a new part for fashion to play in people's lives. And I think that, you know, that's something that you've always seemed to intuit, you've, un, you've intuitively understood with what you present to people. That, that there's always a sense of the hand, you know, the human, mm. humanity. And it, when we, you were talking about being a little bit dislocated from things, we got dislocated from nature. And I guess that means we got dislocated from our humanity in a way as well. Mm. So, you know, after tragedy, is this a positive thing that we could re-engage? Because I do think that's what dis dis disobedient bodies did. We have seen the growth of populism separating people. Yeah. And that show was all about engaging. Yeah. And, um, you know, fashion could be a tool to re-engage with the world. Do, do you see that would be a possibility? You know, I, I think we probably, through this process, will hopefully, if we are um, smart, it will atomize the landscape into a flat page, um, which, I hope will mean that when I did that show, what I really wanted to, uh, first of all, it was meant to be a retrospective, which was just ridiculous to even contemplate. Um, but I wanted to be able to kind of take all the kind of peers, all these kind of like, like historical figures from like Howard Lang to Garbo to Giacometti uh, and put them all in one line. It was just, it was something conceived in a moment. And I feel there was no hierarchy. I feel like we have, you know, uh, we, we, if we can get away from kind of uh, building too many forms of hierarchy um, in the creative industry, then it therefore might open up to collaboration more. And I don't mean collaboration as in, you know, me collaborating with a brand, or it's more about collaborating with each other, sharing of ideas, you know? It's like, I always think of people like Henry Moore making textiles, you know, Barbara Hepworth made textiles, or you have Blissy Bee making buttons. You had cross-pollination of different things, and it was not frowned upon. We didn't go, oh, well, you know, that person is in this box, therefore they have to be in this box. And for me, I, I think through the idea of, exploring make uh, and having uh, honest conversations with different creatives, I think now is a moment that we can kind of um, forge a new type of reality, um, understand why we make things, I think, is instead of, you know, like, I feel like some people feel like t-shirts just come out of a t-shirt machine mm. or, you know, that, when the weather makes a bag, it's just a machine. It's just sitting there, just pops them out. Um, but they don't realize that, you know, there's people who are incredibly skilled, like incredibly skilled, more skilled than I am in make. Um, because they, they have, that kind of knowledge does not happen overnight. You know, you cannot become a fashion designer overnight. You cannot become a bricklayer overnight. It doesn't work that way. You have to get things wrong, you have to experiment, and you can't race. I feel like the race is now over. It's about digesting a bit and um, being honest with ourselves of what is right for you. I, I think my, the biggest thing that I, I think over the last couple of months is like, what is right for me and what is right for the brands that I work for? That's all that matters. I don't think fashion is in, uh, you know, an existential crisis. I don't think, uh, I don't think fashion is, uh, the, you know, completely demoralized. I just think we are in a moment where what is right for you as a brand? What do you want to say? And if you don't want to say it, don't say it. You know what I mean, if someone else is doing it, don't do it. You know, I think, it, it, I find it, it in a weird way, it's, it's really, it clears your mind a bit because you kind of start, in a weird way, I started, you know, I, I was, it's weird that you brought up the Hepworth show because I think that was the starting point for me, which I think really 
changed the way that I was working creatively because it forced me to work for two years on something in the background and waiting for institutions to lend things or find things and then somehow put them into a pattern that was going to be able to, you know, make sense to a five-year-old, a six-year-old, a 9 year old 14-year-old. It didn't matter. It had to, didn't have to be over intelligent. It had, can't be talking down to. Um, and I think through that process, I think it defined that I like to curate things. Um, I'm, I will never be a liar. I, I, I won't be able to cut you the most amazing dress, but I will know and I will trust in the best person to cut that dress. And I will make sure that we promote that person because I feel like the idea of the diva cannot exist anymore. And, and that's my, the thing that I think you start to realize, the diva cannot exist because you have to kind of, it has forced us all to work together here. And everyone is in the same platform. As we said, you know, the virus has no boundary. So therefore we're all in the same boat. And, we, and, and I think through that, in a weird way, it goes back to that idea of a blank page. You know, when I joined Lueve, I wanted the word Lueve on the top of the page. And I wanted to be able to put whatever I wanted into that white page. And I think now, we all can do that. What do we want on our white page? But we have to kind of look and remember what we didn't. We're not going to go back to normal here um, because why would you want to do that? How exciting to be able to kind of cut your own pace. Um, and I think if you make things well, then I think you have a story to tell. I think if you believe in it, then you have a story to tell. I think if you're trying to be something that you're not, then I, I don't think it's gonna work anymore. It can't be fake. Um, I think that's the, the thing that I've noticed we were, when we were talking just before. It's just like, when I flick through Instagram, I kind of feel like, or, or even news or imagery in general, if it feels fake, I, I don't want it. I, I, can't, I can't engage with it. It's sort of, it's the first time that, that imagery like that really sticks out. Uh, because ultimately I think we probably consume more imagery than we do words. So, so sorry, uh, we're off on a tangent. <laughs> no, no, that, that's, a good, that's a good tangent because it, what, it, what it's, this, well, it wasn't a tangent because what it's distilling down to is authenticity, which, you know, the words that were being thrown around before all of this happened were words like authenticity and sustainability. Um, I feel that what's happened is given those words real weight now yeah. that, that what is, what is true is what will last and what is sustainable is also what will last, but sustainable sustainability isn't just about, uh, ways to make your business not be so destructive. I think it's all, there's also a notion of human sustainability and that's where I think the idea of collaboration rather than competition is so yeah. important because human, I think human beings are naturally collaborative. Yeah. And that, that's a really funny thing. You talk about no more divas, but fashion has nurtured the diva and promoted the diva and the sort of genius designer in his ivory tower dispensing his, his or her, um, you know, ideas from on high. Um, even though that was always a bit of a, a, a sort of fantasy, because obviously designers worked with teams who'd realize their ideas, but what would you hope fashion becomes then after this? How, what, what, would, what would you hope people would, would <laughs> see in fashion? How will, it, how will it tell them its stories? Um. I to, for me, I think the, the only way uh, fashion can exist is through the idea of people. You have to give a platform for all people in the organization that you work in, or no matter how big or small your team is. Um, 
you know, I want to know who cuts the pattern. I want to know the person who sources the fabric. I want to know their name. I want to ring them. I, I don't want to email them. I want to ring these people. Um, and that's what I think through this, the, the most amazing thing is the actual landline has become one of the most amazing devices suddenly because I, I've spent more time on a landline because usually signal's not good or, and you talk to people. And I feel that, you know, in a weird way, I, it, when we're going back to this idea of the diva and the, the idea of fake or not real, it's more about, I think, as if as fashion i think we need to kind of have an accountability that when we make something there is people involved and those people will have to be at the front line they need to be the people that we say this person made this and you can follow it and and i think i have done that since i've joined the webway but in this moment, I want to make it even more transparent because I feel that these are the people that have got me through probably one of the most complex moments. I cannot exist without a CEO. I cannot exist without the pattern cutter, the leather developer, the person who sources buttons, all these different things. I don't exist. I'm just the front man who has to bring all of this together and somehow make sense. Um, and I think through this, I think fashion is going to have to kind of um, pull the veil down a bit mm -hmm. and kind of kind of go, well, these are all, this is the team. It's like when we do the Loewe uh, lookbook with um, like Fumiko, we always show the team at the end. Because there's so many people involved. Mm. And I can't do it on my own. And if I did do it on, on my own, how incredibly lonely would that be? And we've already had experienced two months, months of loneliness. Do you know what I mean? It's sort of, you know, the first thing I want to do is I just want to see people. I want to, that's what's important. And I think by, you know, we have all the, we've got huge debates at the moment that will happen. And it will probably, you know, I, can, I feel like September will be another revelation for sure. September, October is going to be something else. Next year is probably going to be maybe financially worse than this year. The knock-on effect is going to be huge. But if we look at the complete, if we look at all the negative, it, it, it's overwhelming. And I think we should kind of like, my mom was always saying to me, you, you have to, you know, you can't eat the whole elephant. You have to <laughs> take a bit by bit. And I feel like there's a lot of things, you know, you're, you're thinking what will fashion be? I can't read the tea leaves on it. And nor should I think anyone because I think if we decide, okay, well, this is what fashion is going to be, and this is where we have to go, then we're not going to create solutions through this period because we're already focusing on a goal where we need to kind of get lost. We have to make huge errors and huge mistakes. We've got one of the biggest problems is going to be environmental, but on the same time, there is a social problem. Um, I feel like the environment because it has no voice, it speaks in a different way. That's why we're here. It does it very silently, you know, birds disappear, things go instinct, water vanishes, uh, famine happens. It's a very slow process. And I think we've hit this kind of like cliff edge. So it is speaking very loudly and it's sort of like, well, would you like to be confined for longer? And probably the answer in humanity would be no. Um, but we cannot forget through this process the human aspect of it. Because in a weird way, as much, there's so much noise that people don't get listened to. And I think anyone who is in part of a business or a business leader has to listen to their people and what they want and what they need to be able to do the best job that they can do and that they feel like they've built something. Um, because I think what will be the biggest mistake here is if we go through this process and we do not balance the two effects, the environment and the people. Because the people will sort the environment out and the environment will sort the people out. And the problem is, is I feel that 
it, it, nature is a very kind of easy tactical thing to kind of save because it sounds good and people you know when a forest burns everyone's like we are going to do we, we, we're going to react we're going to post something on social media we post it on social media and then we do nothing about it um and i think instead of like these sort of actions uh, these sort of kind of like visual actions there needs to be physical actions and i've realized that you, you know you, you you cannot just say i'm going to do something you know here, I support this, but I haven't, I'm not giving a helping hand. You know, yes, you can promote it, but you have to do something. Um, and, and I think, I, I know from having a business, like people's jobs, it's a network, it's people's families, it's all these different things. And with responsibility, you keep those jobs, which keeps families, which keeps communities, which ultimately I then wake up in the morning feeling that I have fulfilled the tiny part that I can do. Um, even when I feel helpless, then I do more of it. And I feel slightly better about making a bag or how do we make a bag better? And I think if we start looking in a balanced way, of long-term solutions, not PR solutions. Like, this is not going to happen overnight. You know, I think in fashion, we have this, like, some sort of, like, etherealness that we are going to change everything and that, you know, <laughs> and we're going to make everything better. But it, I think we have to realize with, with all brands in the world, there, we have to put realistic expectations in this is not a fantasy you know if, if we're going to you know create environmental solutions in season and it should be what is right for your brand you know have you frozen Am I frozen? Maybe I am. Oh, frozen. You, you are frozen. <laughs> well, am I you, frozen? You, you said no more divas. Um, I'm on frozen. <laughs> um, no, you froze. I was uh, thinking about that. What what this has been a lesson in the, the sort of um, implacability of nature, that the way nature has just rolled through, um, rolled through our world like just this huge, not. Well, I suppose you could say uncaring, and that um, it's created this sort of uh, sense of irrelevance in a way. But also, I think more importantly, um, humility. It's kind of humbled us, and uh, I think that that humility re re restores our sense of humanity, perhaps, which restores the sense of what people make and share, and um, I mean, you're talking about the stories of the people that you work with. And this seems to me what, as something that fashion could, could do, uh, could be focusing on after all of this, is after we've processed and, and managed to kind of move, move on, is that if, you, if, you, if you're transparent about the stories of all your people and you tell the, and you pass these stories on to the world, I think everybody begins to understand why what you do is precious and valuable if they understand the, the dignity of, of human labor in whatever it is, a dress, a bag, whatever, shoes. And then, you know, they understand why it costs what it costs and they understand what it uses, what it uses up, what it returns. And, and you have a, people have a totally different relationship, could have a totally different relationship with fashion. That, that wouldn't, that isn't about big spectacular fashion shows or anything. It is actually about, you know, a human exchange. That's a kind of ideal of mine anyway. Yeah, no, but I think it's about kind of evoking empathy on all levels. You know, I think really kind of, I don't know, like when you, when you think, it is very, I think what is so fantastic about fashion is it's very easy to kind of, if you want to pick a fight with something, fashion is a very easy thing to pick a fight with. Um, because there's so many levels of uncertainty in you know? it. Plus, it's um, it's always been kind of somehow some sort of uh, 
fashion is used by everyone globally, clothing. Um, but in a weird way, part of the fashion industry's mechanism is to kind of become like a nucleus, a kind of protected fire zone where it sort of, it needs to kind of create desire through um, elitism um, somehow. But the problem is, is that elitism doesn't work. It doesn't work. It is, it is one of these kind of, if, when you see politicians using it as a kind of uh, marketing tool, um, it is a word that does not work anymore for people. Um, um, and I think by looking at the aspect of people's humility to how something is made from start to finish, we might be able to kind of understand collectively what the problems are to solve uh, social problems, uh, financial problems, uh, you know, people problems, uh, all these different aspects. If we were transparent, then you could be able to dig into it. I think the problem is, is that we are so shrouded in the idea of uh, not being transparent because transparency scares us, you know, on Instagram, mm. the idea of transparency scares people. Um, Especially in fashion secrets, uh, the, fashion, the fashion industry trades in secrecy. So, yeah. um, you know, that, that, that is a huge issue. So and, uh, maybe that will change, but you know, I, I, the, my fear, I, I think, um, as I start to kind of even contemplate and going back into an office, um, is that we will revert quickly back to war, where we were quicker than we think. Um, and the reason probably being is, is that we want to go back to normal somehow. Um, but I, I think there is this kind of little candle of hope that is kind of saying, well, actually, no. Um, this is the warning, first warning, you know, um, learn from it. And I think, I think you, we will see, you know, there's going to be huge companies, no matter if it's fashion or cars or planes or, uh, Amazon, all different things. There are going to be big learnings from this. And at the bottom of it will be the two things, which will be environment and people. Um, but we cannot kind of, uh, I find at the moment it's sort of like um, it's me like the kind of fake realities like where like I, I can't remember was I reading it in some newspaper where it's like it was like dolphins in in um, Venice but there wasn't it was like kind of yeah. like we just weren't real and and I was like I was like how are we still in this like what's real what is not real you know what we should be really wanting is reality you know everything must be real now because if we see everything that is real we're going to be able to work out what needs fixing but the problem is we don't know what to fix because it's all so many moving parts so i'm hoping that you know there's going to be people from all bottoms from the top to the bottom of all different corporations and all different kinds of institutions are going to be kind of going show me the reality and I think fashion is going to have to show the reality. And if we do that, I think we can not engage people through light culture, but through culture, you know. I mean, you really couldn't be looking forward to going back to doing 12 collections a year, for example. I, you know, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm, maybe there's something completely combusted with me somehow, but... I did not feel in what I was doing before, I did not feel overworked. And that's uh, maybe sounds like a very strange thing to say. I feel what, that I, each project that I was doing had its own form of reality and it, had, it fulfilled different parts of this jigsaw. Um, and I think everything, that I was doing, I felt like I wanted to have a purpose. You know what I mean? I, I, didn't, I wasn't gonna put out something I didn't believe in. I, I think the problem, I think, is not the work level. It's not being able to process what you have done. Mm. 
Yeah. Um, I, uh, it's a blur to me. Um, and now I'm sitting, picking up the pieces and going, you know, I loved doing the basket project with the Wefe. I loved it. It was like, that was a fantastic project to work on, but it took two years. Um, you know, it's like Paul Zabitha. I love that project because it's like, if I was younger, I would want to be going out to nightclubs like that now. I want to be able to jump off a building. I want to be able to, you know, go out all night. So it's like a kind of emotional engagement, it's storytelling. So I feel like it's not that I would, I, I would want to do less, I would want maybe more time to be able to do the projects for longer um, and more long-term things, you know, uh, I think we will probably revert back to some form of show, not this year, maybe next year, but it doesn't matter when. I think it's just deciding how, what is going to turn you on in terms of format, you know? I, you know, I think, yes, it's quite convenient. Everyone shows in groups and uh, fashion weeks are one big kind of, uh, I don't know, big kind of buffet, but maybe it's not about the buffet anymore. Maybe we, maybe the journalist and the seamstress needs time to digest it. Maybe we need to be able to digest it instead of um, shaming it or hating it or loving it or not loving it or critiquing it in a way. Maybe it's about kind of like delving deeper. Um, what is the emotional reaction from it? Like, emotionally, are we engaged with it? Um, I think when you see so many collections, it's very difficult to emotionally engage with something. I, that's why I'm, uh, the, the, the idea of what we talked about engagement, um, I think that's, that is a huge challenge. I think to engage people in a way uh, where they appreciate substance, um, where, where they're moved, where emotion becomes important, where pure consumption isn't really the end game of everything. It is about this engagement. But I, I, what, I, what I really, what, another thing I enjoyed about Disobedient Bodies was the idea of hindsight that you can, it's, it's curating of course, where you can make a new world using these elements of, by juxtaposing elements of, from all different areas. And I think that's the wonderful thing about artisanship that you yeah. can pull bits and pieces from across centuries and, and make a new, an incredible new reality. And I guess, I mean, it's this, this about learning lessons from history, I suppose. Do you feel that, I mean, what lessons do you feel you will take away for yourself with, um, from this experience, with, with everything you've cherished in the past, what will, what will your future, what will your own future look like, do you think? Um, I think it will be less is more. Than mm. more that less is better. I think it's going to be about, I, I think it's never going to be more so the moment of the edit. We're going to have to edit a lot. And I, and I, I think probably everyone, maybe I'm, maybe I think everyone's been doing it. I have cleaned the house from top to bottom. So the idea of spring cleaning, I've done in spring for the first time. Myself, I've cleaned every single thing, every cupboard, every drawer. I, the amount of stuff that was not needed. The, the, the bags of stuff that needs to go to charity. The, the stuff that needed to be fixed that, was, or, that you were going to replace but just needed fixed. Mm. Um, I, I think everyone has done that. I think everyone has been at home and they have had the time to fix things and to edit. And we've edited our brains, we've edited our homes, we've edited our gardens, we've edited our uh, notebooks, paper, whatever. Um, it's like food. I enjoy making food. I don't want to rush food. I, you know, I, I can wait on food. It's not like I need to wait on a delivery. I would rather, and I feel like I have that better 
and therefore if I have better, I see better, you know. Not making sourdough, are you? Sourdough bread. I'm not there at that moment. <laughs> I mean, it's good salads. Um, but even just slowing down that process and that cleanup, I think, I, I, mean, I think with even with work at the moment, I feel like, do we really need that? Mm. No. So let's, you know, I don't feel obliged to do it for an industry. Do you know what I mean? It's sort of like, it, you know, it's like we had to, we, you know, we worked on pallets for a year. It was a project that we had shot like seven months ago. Um, it was something I was incredibly proud of. To put it out in the middle of this was um, a very difficult process for me. And, and I sat and I was thinking, you know, how am I going to be able to show something that I believe in right now when it's the least of anyone's problems? Um, so that's why I was like, I sat and I wrote a letter and I put it with a book and, and I sent it and it's, you can digest it, you can consume it or not. It's more about kind of, this is what I did. But now going forward, it's like, everything needs to be, it needs to be that personal. Mm. I think if you're designing something, you should be able to write about it and you should be able to talk to someone about it. Um, I don't think it's about vanishing anymore. I think the more I kind of, I, I think when you look at history in those kind of really horrible moments, it is when I look at people who are making masks or uh, helping out communities, those are people stepping up to the front line. Now is not the moment to be silent or to be unactive. It is the moment to kind of, you've cleaned out now is a moment if we can learn if we take all these things of helping out people we can then apply this to so many different things it's like it's so easy it sounds so easy but if we go back to where we were before then it will not have been worthwhile like when are we ever going to have two months to have headspace in this way it's very rarely happens and to be honest, in other generations, they have to probably do harder things than we have ever had to do, which is to stay at home and to prevent the spread of, of a virus. But how amazing has it been able to reflect? And we don't know how long this will continue for. But I don't think it's how long it should be. I think we will be in this process until we are ready. And I think that's why I kind of refuse to kind of read the tea leaves that everything is going to change because change is not, in an industry that we work in, is going to have to be collectively, no matter how big or small, how rich, how not rich the companies are, it is going to have to be a team effort. It's not going to be about, I don't think this is a moment about competition. I think this is about a, a moment of kind of like, people need to get round tables and fight it out and debate it out. I think it's the most amazing moment for debate. And um, I think in that moment, I think then we could be Maybe it's an utopia. Maybe I've maybe I've been <laughs> indoors for too long and I've become completely uh, in a fairy tale. But you know, I, I think we could be in this very um, special moment that we could, in a weird way, give a backbone to fashion and to actually realize that it is a very important um, part of the cultural landscape that makes us question things, realities, textures, textiles, people, how we make things, because ultimately, no matter who you are, we all can make, you know? That's what we're seeing. I mean, people are out it's, there making things, yeah. Yeah. At home. It's, it's sort of relaxing somehow. I think w when you kind of, you know, when you sit and watch someone make bread or they're making 
rainbows or they're making masks. There's something where it is quite relaxing. It's quite a kind of um, watching someone do something with their hands. It's sort of, uh, it is fascinating. Like someone who can draw, like I, I would love to be a painter. How amazing would it be able to paint at this moment? Um, I would love to be a musician. You know, it's sort of, yeah, you know, like it would be, you look at these people and you're kind of, when I look at other creatives, I'm like, how amazing that, that you know, it's like, I look at, for example, um, comedians online and how they have been able to use their craft to be able to do it. How fantastic and how to bring a smile to someone's face. You know, and I think, we have been able to kind of show creativity in this last moment in a kind of like in a raw format, unedited. The, that is what's so kind of amazing. And I think in a weird way, probably there will be things that will carry through, which will be maybe, I, I want to know more about people, but I want to physically know them, not be, it's, I think we have been so cooked up digitally that I think the minute someone can get, you know, it's this, the minute someone can give someone a hug is going to be the most amazing sensation um, because it's going to be a kind of tactile one. And I think maybe that's what's going to have to change possibly through fashion is that there cannot be this veneer. You're going to have to kind of, you have to let it all hang out, you know, good and bad. Um, because it's real. No one wants a prescribed image. We want kind of real things, you know, we, and I, and I think that could be, I think fashion is romantic and I think it could make fashion more romantic somehow. The romanticness, uh, the ro romance of making something, the idea of brands that last forever and uh, these, you know, heroic people is sort of, uh, one, one image that I think through this whole I can't remember who shot the image. It's probably really bad in my fashion history, but it's a kind of it's a woman, uh, it's a picture of a woman, very famous in a Digby Morton suit. Her back is turned to the camera, and she's looking um, at a building that has fallen during the war. Isn't it Cecil Beaton? I think it might be Cecil Beaton, yeah. and it's sort of turned and it's a kind of conjured and it's sort of in, in a male fabric. And it's Cecil Beaton or Lee Miller, and. I remember being at university and, mm. you know, looking at that image and kind of not being able to kind of like understand it. But when I think of an image, I think in this, more, in this moment, that is the image because ultimately everything has fallen apart. Um, but if you put your fingers of the broken building and you were to reimagine what could be what she is looking at, it could be anything now. Um, but maybe it's fine that we don't know, you know, maybe we will, maybe the stock market will crash back down to 2016 and it will have to rebuild from there again. We don't know. Maybe, you know, maybe fashion will recover really fast. We don't know. But I, I think right now that's not the priority. I think the priority is like, going back to the beginning of our conversation, which is like, what is right for you? And, and what is right for the organization that you're in? And when you do that, then you're gonna end up with these amazing solutions that are long-term and might get us for another 10 years. Um, I think it's, if it's going to be, um, if we're reading the future and it's, being able to be decided right now in the middle of a crisis, I think they are kind of more of, of an utopia than a reality, you know? Jonathan, thank yes. you so much. We'll, thank you very much. We'll leave you on that, um, on that thought because <laughs> utopia is always a dream. Well, thank you very much. We'll for utopia and not dystopia. So I can't wait to see you again. God knows when that'll be. It'll be very soon. <laughs> thank you, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye.